Hi, my name is Ashley Brackett, and for my final research paper and presentation, I will be discussing prisons and the comparison between punishment versus rehabilitation methods. This presentation aims to closely examine both sides of the debate based on the effectiveness in lowering recidivism rates and improving inmate well-being. I first want to start off by explaining the criminal justice system has developed five principles that they follow in order to protect society and individuals' rights that are deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, retribution, and restitution. Deterrence has two different types, specific and general, which I will explain later in this presentation. Incapacitation is when the offender is removed from the public and society and placed in jails, prisons, house arrests, etc. Rehabilitation attempts to alter the offender's behavior in order to prevent them from committing future crimes. Fourth is retribution, which is also known as punishment, and is when the offender is disciplined based on their crime committed. Finally, restitution is when the offender is ordered by the court to pay victims fully or partially for any type of damage that they may have suffered from the crime. The first section I will now be introducing and defining terms you will hear very often throughout the rest of this presentation. The first of these terms is prisons and is defined as facilities used to combine convicted offenders who have been sentenced for a period longer than a year. Prisons are known as long-term facilities and are operated by the state and federal governments. They are used and put into place to preserve order and safety, to affirm norms of the lawful conduct, and to help remedy criminal behavior in society. The next term I'd like to talk about is punishment, and this is the legal process whereby violators of criminal law are condemned and sanctioned in accordance with specified legal categories and procedures. Punishments are put into place to hold offenders accountable and to show society's disapproval of the crime. Today's justice system still seeks to provide justice to the victims that have been hurt and penalize offenders to the necessary extent of their crime. Next is rehabilitation, which is a more positive punishment method that focuses on transforming the actions and behaviors of the offender. The main goal for the justice system is to incorporate these programs by lowering the recidivism rates and improving offenders' mental health, behaviors, and social interactions. By helping offenders reform their minds, they are, are then better prepared to re-enter back into their community upon their release. The final term is recidivism. This refers to a person's relapse into criminal behavior often after they have been released from a sanction. An inmate has two choices upon their release reoffend or desist from committing further crime. The criminal justice system has a goal of having lower recidivism rates and fewer inmates reoffending. I will later talk about a few techniques that can be done and have proved to be effective in lowering these rates. Now that we have gone over the terms, I'd like to get into the literature review and more background evidence on these terms. First, I'm going to start out with the history of prisons. Prisons and punishment have been an integral part of society for many centuries to serve and hold offenders accountable for their crimes. In the 1700s, criminal law and offenders were left to self-policying that was based on religion, English barbarity, and pragmatism. During this time, there was a much bigger focus on physical punishment and intense labor, which meant there wasn't much need for prisons. But after years of those methods proving not to deter crime, the idea of incarceration arose. In 1891, the federal prison system was established and allowed for three prisons in the United States to be funded and begin construction. By 1930, the Federal Bureau of Prisons was established to oversee the entire prison systems and were used to isolate criminals and maintain safety in a community. Throughout the 20th century, prison systems were used to isolate criminals and maintain safety in a community and then continuing through the 21st century, imprisonment was the dominant punishment sanction used against offenders. Next, I'd like to talk about prison population. Prison population deals with the number of inmates that are incarcerated in prisons or facilities that are governed by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The year 1925 is when data began being collected on the prison population across America. The number of inmates stayed consistent from 1920s to the beginning of the 1970s. But as the graph shows, by 1973, the incarceration rate began to rise drastically and has continued to grow over many decades. This significant growth was due to sentence legislation, increase in drug crime, and tougher policies. It was not until 2009 the prison population saw a slight decline, and by 2015 it was the lowest it had been since 2005 and was continuing to decrease. 
Most recently, COVID-19 has heavily affected the prison population as the United States began working in March of 2020 to lower the rate of the prison population due to threatening impacts of the pandemic. COVID-19 is continuing to affect the prison population, and it is still unknown how long the pandemic's impacts will affect the justice system as a whole. Next, I want to look into the history of punishment. Punishment has been a common technique and used against individuals who have committed a wrongful act. Since the Middle Ages and throughout the 18th century, individuals experienced torture, such as whipping, branding, and mutilating to prevent further crime activity. Additionally, corporal and capital punishment were common forms of punishment at this time. As time progressed, many new prisons were being constructed and built, and harsh physical punishment techniques were on the downside. By the 1970s, punishment efforts evolved to being heavily focused on fines and imprisonment. The idea of deterrence began growing towards the end of this century and into the 21st, where the focus was to de deter individuals from committing the same crime due to the consequences that were given. Today, punishment efforts are more focused individually on the severity of a crime that is committed and handled in a more humane way. Throughout history, there have been many theories associated with punishment. First is the retribution theory, which holds that punishment is justifiable because it is deserved. This theory is based on seeking revenge towards the offender and has the goal to make them suffer for their wrongdoing. Another common motive for punishment comes from the deterrence theory. This theory focuses on looking to the future and aims to prevent this particular person and others from committing crimes. The deterrence theory has the main goal of promoting fear in the community by showing society that if a crime is committed, there will be punishment enforced. Lastly is the utilitarian theory. The goal of this theory is to achieve the most positive outcomes and everyone involved should be looking out for the greater good of society. This theory looks to give minimal potential suffering to an offender and looks to give a punishment that is justifiable and just as equally effective as a harsher punishment. Now I'll talk about the history of rehabilitation. The idea of rehabilitation came about in the late 19th century when state prisons were becoming overcrowded and dangerous for inmates. This reformation brought individual treatment programs for prisoners where they could work to better themselves. The medical treatment model was one that emerged throughout the 1950s and 60s and had the goal of changing the harsh punishment inmates were previously receiving. This model found that harsh labor and physical punishment inmates were receiving was actually not changing their behavior and pushed to look beyond the crime that was committed and instead focus on why it was committed. Leading into the 1970s, the rehabilitation theory began to lose interest as the method lacked evidence that proved the true effects of the treatment programs. Although rehabilitation efforts were discredited in the early 1970s, methods of rehabilitation are still heavily used across many state prisons today. The treatment program used in modern society has been altered to more evidence-based method methods that have proved to be effective in lowering recidivism rates. Next, I'd like to just go over a few rehabilitation programs. There are many different programs that are offered as rehabilitation services for inmates that are in prison. Drug treatment is a common growing pro program that is offered to those who may suffer from substance abuse. A more general program that is offered to inmates revolves around their education. Many prisons offer inmates a chance to continue growing their education through programs that are similar to attending a school. Next is job-specific training programs that allow for inmates to prepare themselves for the jobs they may qualify for upon their release. Next, behavioral and therapeutic rehabilitation services intend to help inmates who may be suffering physically, psychologically, or socially in any way. Lastly, mental health treatment programs are growing across America as this is becoming a bigger problem focus. As mentioned earlier, recidivism is measured by criminal acts that resulted in the re-arrest, reconviction, or reincarceration of the offender over a specific period of time, usually being nine years. The likelihood of recidivism increases more each year after the offender is released. For example, 25% of offenders that are released from a state prison will usually re-offend within six months of their release, and 75% will re-offend after five years. Additionally, there are many causes that affect the likelihood of an offender reoffending and failing to re-enter their community successfully. Research has looked at age, gender, previous criminal history, and other socioeconomic factors that their relationship and their relationship to the probability of reoffending. Age has been shown to have an effect on recidivism rates as juvenile offenders have a higher risk of rearrest within the first six to nine months of their first release from incarceration compared to adults. 
Also, violent offenders typically have higher rates of recidivism than that of nonviolent offenders. The majority of incarcerated individuals have release dates in the future, and it is up to the prison facilities to ensure those inmates receive the proper treatment before re-entering them back to their community in order to lower these recidivism rates. Next, we're going to look at each method's effects on recidivism rates. Much research has been done on the effect the punishment methods used by prisons against criminals has on recidivism rates. The main punishment method used is incarceration, which is separating the criminals from their home community. Evidence shows that punishment does not lower recidivism and does not have an effect on deterrence. Other research shows that not only do harsher conditions such as security levels have higher rates of recidivism, but longer sentences have shown to have higher recidivism rates too. On the other hand, rehabilitation techniques have shown to lower recidivism rates since they intend to improve inmates' mental, emotional, and social. It is important to note that not all rehabilitation programs have had a positive effect on recidivism, but many programs do and help offenders with a smoother transition back to their community. Overall, there is an increasing research and evidence proving prisons that enforce and emphasize rehabilitation programs reduce recidivism rates among offenders. Now I'd like to look at three different prevention strategies. First is the attempt to prevent crime through imprisonment. As mentioned earlier, deterrence methods are used to keep others in the community from committing crimes and ending up in prison. General deterrence focuses on reducing crime due to the true threat of punishment. Specific deterrence, rather, focuses on the individual who actually receives the punishment and hopes to discourage them from committing further crimes. These techniques are used to attempt to lower crime rates and keep members of society from being incarcerated. Second is preventing a higher prison populations. Due to the change in policy and mandatory sentencing minimums, there was a large increase in the number of individuals being sent to prison. Techniques such as parole or probation were used throughout the 1990s and years later in an attempt to lower the prison population. The United States should look to follow many steps that other countries have used to lower their prison population. For example, Finland adjusted their sentencing and experienced an ideological shift in the thinking of punishment, which led to bringing down their incarceration rate. The United States has continued to see a steady decline in the prison population, but still has work to do to lower incarceration rates even more. The last prevention strategy is preventing high levels of recidivism. The high rates of recidivism show the need for something to change in America's prisons to stop the continuing cycle of reoffending and offer better public safety. Colorado was just one state who reclassified sentencing guidelines, which saved the facilities money where they were able to provide more rehabilitation programs. Evidence-based programs have also been researched heavily in prisons to find better programs to assist inmates to lower their chances of recidivism once entering back into their society. The risk and needs assessment focuses on the individual offender and hopes to assess their needs and offer treatment programs that are based on those risk and needs. The method is not only effective in prisons, but has shown effectiveness in other areas of punishment and supervision, such as parole systems and probation. Next, I will be listing four intervention strategies prisons can use to better help the well-being of inmates while also lowering recidivism rates. The first intervention strategy is individualized rehabilitation programs. There are many conditions an individual must face when becoming incarcerated for their crime. All individuals that enter the prison system come from different backgrounds and are affected by incarceration differently, which means their needs of treatment will differ based on each individual offender. Cognitive behavioral therapy is one program prisons offer that help the offenders change the patterns of their individual behavior that led them to commit the crime in the first place. The next intervention strategy is addressing the growing concern of an inmate's mental health. The prevalence of mental health problems within prison raises the need for mental health treatment programs being offered in the facilities. Mental health conditions have proven to have a significant effect on the individuals and the likelihood of them reoffending. By, by implementing more mental illness treatment programs, both in prisons and once an offender is released, they will have a positive effect on recidivism rates and overall safety of a community. Another intervention strategy is providing more educational programs. Both education and employment are factors that affect the number of people who enter prisons and the risk level of those individuals reoffending. Research has shown that inmates who participate in educational programs while incarcerated have lower recidivism rates than those who do not. 
Employment educational services provide many benefits to adult offenders by preparing them for their release and giving them the necessary skills to obtain and maintain jobs once integrated back into society. The last intervention strategy is maintaining family interactions while incarcerated. This is huge for offenders. Research has shown that prisons who stay in close contact with their family and friends in the community while incarcerated have lower recidivism rates than those who lose contact. When inmates stay in contact with their friends and families, they are also staying close with their community, making it so they will have a strong support system even when they are released. The next section is the legal analysis where I looked at certain court cases, amendments, and clauses that relates to prison regulation and an inmate's rights. First, I looked at the Eighth Amendment, which holds excessive bails shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. Prior to the Eighth Amendment, there were no rules that limited the amount of punishment the government could impose on a criminal offender. Once passed, the government was no longer allowed to use barbaric or methods of torture against criminals as punishment. Cases such as Miller v. Alabama and O'Neill v. Vermont discussed what is defined as cruel or unusual punishment. Further, the Supreme Court case Gregg v. Gamble established two tests that help courts decide the constitutionality of a punishment. It ruled that a punishment is deemed unconstitutional if it involves the unnecessary and wanton infliction of pain or is grossly disproportionate to the crime. Next, as it relates to inmates' rights, Price v. Johnston is one historical court case that noted once a criminal enters the penal system, they are stripped of many privileges and rights. Also, the Special Litigation Section of the Civil Rights Division helps protect the civil rights of individuals across many areas. This section protects the right of people in a state or local institution, including jails, prisons, juvenile detention facilities, and health care facilities for persons with disabilities. Lastly, the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, in combination with the 8th Amendment, gives equal rehabilitative rights to all prisoners against any form of discrimination. Although rehabilitation methods have not been defined as a constitutional right of inmates in prison, they are still crucial in helping the prison system lower recidivism rates. The last section is my three plan to action strategies that aim to help the prison system lower both incarceration rates and recidivism rates. The first plan to action is focusing on restorative justice rather than punishment. Restorative justice is commonly defined as an approach to justice that focuses on addressing the harm caused by crime while holding the offender responsible for their actions by providing an opportunity for the parties directly affected by the crime to talk about it. This method seeks to reinstate meaningful connections and repair any damage that the crime may have caused but also hold the offender accountable for the crime they committed. Communities and victims can come together and speak out to share their concerns dealing with their crime committed and helps deter future crime from happening in the area. Secondly, providing better mental health treatment programs in prisons. There are circumstances that an inmate may face in prison that add to their level of stress and critically affects their mental health such as overcrowding, violence, lack of privacy, and failure to provide meaningful social interactions. There is poor coordination of the mental health services and treatment programs offered to inmates both in prisons and upon their release back to their community. Prisons should work to incorporate more mental health treatment programs with inmates while also becoming more aware of the overall health and well-being of their prisoners before returning them back to their community. Finally, reducing the use of solitary confinement. Solitary confinement was first used in the prison system over 200 years ago when America had a prison as punishment outlook on it. Throughout history, harsh punishment methods like solitary confinement provided no evidence that it was achieving its intended purposes, proving they achieved the desired outcomes expected to, lo to lower recidivism rates. There is a need to lower the use of this punishment as it is not proven to lower those rates, deter crime, or be a useful method in punishing certain offenders. This method of punishment has proved to have negative psychological, cognitive, and physiological effects on those inmates. There are forms of alternative programs that can be used, and some prisons are using them, which include reentry programming and integrated housing units that are more effective than solitary confinement. In conclusion, the prison system should work to steadily transition from old theories of punishment and begin to look at stronger methods of handling inmates once incarcerated, focusing on recovering their state of mind and lowering recidivism rates across America's prisons. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and learning more about punishment versus rehabilitation.